Hey ho everyone, Red Angel here. Before I start the video in earnest, I wanted to apologize for my overly long hiatus. I'll explain it more in an update video that I'll link in the future once I have that all done and squared away. If you're part of my old group of watchers, thanks for sticking with me. You have no idea how much that means to me. If you're a new hatchling, well, let's get this show started. Greetings one and all. If you know anything about me, then you know that I love video games where you get to raise little monsters to be your best friend and defend you to the end. The biggest franchise of this genre obviously being Pokemon. You must be thinking to yourself, what kind of Pokemon does Red Angel like? Actually, probably none of you have ever wondered this, but I'm gonna tell you anyways in a series of videos just for fun. If you'd like to see another Pokemon video after this one, be sure to comment and subscribe so I'll see your engagement. I know I don't usually ask for that, but hey, new era of Red Angel, what can I say? Now, here's how this is going to work. I'll talk about Pokemon I like and why I like them. If I don't talk about a Pokemon, don't worry, that doesn't mean I hate them. It only means I feel neutral about them. Usually. I'm going to spam y'all positively before I talk about the handful of Pokemon from across the generations that I just don't care for. Let's go all the way back to the beginning, to 1996, with the original 150 plus one Pokemon. Off to the Kanto region we go. Might as well start off with the ones that started it all, the starters. Charmander, Bulbasaur, and Squirtle. Are they overused? Yes. Does that affect my love for them? No. Listen, I'm a Floridian for goodness sakes. They ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get- Of course I have a strong love for baby lizards, turtles, and toads. They're part of my day-to-day -day life here. All of the starters are cute and they turn into something cool. It's as simple as that. I used all of them more than once, and to be honest, I do favor Charmander if only because I used to catch more lizards in my backyard than toads or turtles. I didn't know it would turn into a dragon, and I'm not going to lie, I was pretty disappointed. A Godzilla-styled lizard would have been peak design, or at least in my childlike opinion. I think Blastoise is the best looking final form of the starters, if, at least if we're going by the design philosophies of the original 151. But I do think that Ivysaur is the best middle form, and Charmander is the best original form. Why do I think Charmander is the best starter form? Well, it's because Charmander has a cute little belly and I want to poke it, that's why. Caterpie, Metapod, Butterfree, Weedle, Kakuna, Beedrill. I have a small attachment to the early level Bugmons. I think they're both great in their own right, and giving them alternative forms with Beedrill getting a Mega Evolution and Butterfree getting a Gigantamax is really cool. I'll admit I don't have the same love for them as later bug Pokemon that come down the line, but I'd be lying if I said I never tried to take one of these little wiggly friends to the very end of the game to become the Pokemon League champion. Only not as much as future bug Pokemon. Pidgey, Pidgeotto, and Pidgeot. The original bird trio. A simple design to a young fledgling bird starting out to a juvenile and then finally an adult. I found it funny that they gradually got longer hair as they evolve, which shows their general age, but in real life, birds get crests and feathers that look like this too as they mature, so it's a realistic look at a bird. Even if Pidgeot looks more like an advertisement for a shampoo commercial than an actual bird, depending on how you look at it. L'Oreal Advanced Hair Care, the science behind extraordinary hair. And you're worth it. Spiro and Firo. Angry murder birds that are underrated in my opinion. I know they attacked Ash in the first episode and are typically used by antagonistic characters, but they look so angular and delightfully fierce that I wouldn't have minded if a main character picked one up along one of their journeys. Pidgeot was the noble eagle, but Firo was based on Anhingas, or devil birds, who use their long beaks to spear their prey. While they might not have the best stats in the world, I really do wish that they'd give them an mega evolution or something, maybe to get them on that same level of popularity as Pidgeot. But that is definitely my bias talking. Pikachu and Raichu. I love Pikachu. 
He's overrated, but I still love him. My first Pokemon experience was getting Pokemon Yellow with a Yellow Game Boy, a Pikachu plush, and a Pikachu Game Boy carrying case. And I still have all of them. I originally tried to collect all of the Pikachu cards. For those of you who collect Pokemon cards, you know that didn't go well. What I find funny though, is that I didn't develop a strong love of Raichu until I was older. I felt pretty neutral about Raichu overall, but once I played the games that actually let me evolve with him, I grew attached quite quickly. Which I think signifies my growth as a player because I started giving time to Pokemon that I hadn't before. Pokemon like Raichu. To me, it's like Pikachu represents my childhood self and Raichu represents represents my growth into adulthood. But maybe I'm overthinking the meaning of my attachment for these electric rodents. Sandshrew and Sandslash. Despite the weirdness of the episode that Sandshrew premiered in, seriously, why did they give that child a whip? I know they were trying to make this kid deliberately unlikable by making him whip the desert rodent, but that was uncalled for. Anyways, I've always loved Sandshrew and Sandslash. Against Surge, this little desert mouse was awesome. A pangolin is such an awesome critter to base a Pokemon on, and they really got the massive claws for those high crit moves. The Alolan form was super solid, and while I didn't like that four times weakness to fighting and fire, Ice Steel did cover some of the destructive forces with Fairy and Dragon. Also, both versions of Sandshrew are super cuddly. And I can still poke Sand Slash's cute little nose when it evolves. I love them. The Nidoking King and Nidoqueen Queen lines. Sexual dimorphism in Pokemon was unheard of back when Pokemon originally came out, except for the Pink Butterfree and Nidoking King and Nidoqueen. Queen. The way that their design betrays the kind of Pokemon they are. Nidoking King shows more outward spikes, signifying its higher attack, and how it looks like Nidoqueen Queen has a set of armor, signifying her higher defenses. It's like in chess, how the queen defends the king, or at least that's how I've always thought about it. Nidoqueen Queen defended her king so he could land the final blow, like a battle couple almost. Poison Ground isn't the best typing, but the sheer amount of moves it can learn really does make up for it. You'd be hard pressed to find someone who's played through the original Kanto games or even the remakes that didn't use one of the Nidoh lines at least once. Even if they've fallen out of fashion now compared to other Pokemon, I'll always have a soft spot for them. Clefairy and Clefable, and also Clefa. Clefable was my MVP back during the original Kanto games, and I had two shinies in the Johto games when they first came out. And one of them was a male Cleffa who became a Clefable that I named Plexa the Great and Terrible. <laughs> And I loved him. Had a whole backstory for him and everything. He was a great battler. They were normal types back before the fairy typing was first introduced, and despite that, they were still quite strong. Able to tank through moves and use fun random moves from Metronome, which was extremely entertaining to use back then. Especially when your Clefable uses Roar of Time during a competitive match. Oh, and by the way, the unaware ability that Clefable has is extremely strong and it makes several people rage quit on online matches. Uh, good times. Good times. Oddish, Gloom, Vileplume, and Blossom. So there's this old game called Hey You Pikachu, and there's a quest in it where you have to pull onions out of the ground, but avoid accidentally pulling out an Oddish. Pulled out an Oddish, then Pikachu would get grossed out and then passed out. That was what really made me start to notice Oddish. It's a mellow onion that turns into one of the most disgusting plants in the world. Yes, there is an alternative form with that little flower gal with an entire song from the Pokemon the movie 2000, but the contrast between these two designs and how the flower on Gloom's head flourishes is chef's kiss. Stunning. Do they stay in the shade with a leaf stone or do they go out in the sun with the sunstone? That's a great design right there. Growlithe and Arcanine. My son! 
easily my favorite fire type. It reminds me of my silly Labrador that had a single brain cell that I had as a child. A big fluffy doggo that finally got a variant, and while they're considerably more fragile with the rock subtype, they have access to Rockhead, which prevents recoil, and that gives it an advantage over its original incarnation. I love the amazing design of this big doggy, clearly inspired by the statues in China called Shisha, which are based on lions, tigers, and dogs, traits that Arcanine shows off beautifully. One of my many fantasies as a child was riding on the back of an Arcanine into the horizon, Princess Mononoke style. Slowpoke, Slowbro, and Slowking. These dopey little dudes deserve all the love they get. I adore the idea that they're so dense they don't even evolve on their own. They just wait for a shelter to bite their tail or their head. And I know they're not from Kanto, but I love that they added Slowking to give a variation on how shelter worked and how to change the physiology of the Slowpoke that it latches on. Their designs never miss, even in their regional variants. The mega evolution for Slowbro is the funniest thing in the world to me. Whose idea was it to put this man inside of his shelter? It makes me laugh every time I see it. Seal and Dugong. Why don't these two have an alternate form or a new evolution? These would be the perfect Pokemon for a new evolution. Wake up, Game Freak! The most forgotten water ice type. I love these dopey boys. A real-life Dugong is such a cute animal, and they could have done a regional variant with it, and the other members of the same genus, yet they didn't. Such a missed opportunity. They're cute and overall solid if you don't want to use Lapras for some reason. Or if you were like me and had no idea where to get Lapras until after you beat the Elite Four. <sighs> Game facts were a gift back then. I also have a plush of Seal from back when I worked as a Pokemon salesperson. It was a KFC exclusive over here in the States. Ghastly, Haunter, and Gengar. The OG Ghost! They deserve all the hype. Such solid, spooky Pokemon. The true shadow of Clefable. Look it up. I've adored these Pokemon forever. Well, maybe more so Haunter than Gengar. But I never had anyone to trade and get a Gengar with in the first place until I got to high school. When I finally traded and got a Gengar, I'm not going to lie, I missed Haunter. You can never go wrong if you pick these ghosts for your team. Or if you're like me, and became the Pokemon Champion of Sinnoh without evolving your Haunter. Hitmonchan, my personal favorite fighting type from Generation 1. The elemental punches, the good defenses, and the pretty solid design really emulate the vibe of a boxer. I have a fair amount of knowledge through boxing as a sport that I generally enjoy watching, and I like Pokemon. It is a nice tribute to it. Happini, Chansey, and Blissey. I love that the quintessential Pokemon known for taking care of others has been an absolute menace in competitive Pokemon since its inception. Good for Chansey. Good for her. Her simplistic design is overtly appealing to the eyes no matter what part of her evolutionary chain you see. Because, well, there's a circle, there's pink and red and white, just like the colors you would typically see in a stereotypical nurse. They don't overly complicate the perfect design, question me if you will, but I think Chansey, even after it was updated in future generations to have evolutions and pre-evolutions, is a borderline perfect Pokemon. Kangaskhan a single dinosaur kangaroo who works two jobs, who loves her kid and never stops, with gentle hands and the heart of a fighter. She's a survivor. Kangaskhan is one of the many Pokemon that had its original episode edited very heavily for the English release of the show. This is because in The Kangaskhan Kid, Tommy asked to nurse on Misty's chest. <sighs> I hate being a fan of anime sometimes. Anyway, I truly love this funky girl and her kid. They've always been one of the most reliable normal type Pokemon, even if her encounter and catch rate in the Safari Zone is abysmally low. When her Mega came out, it was one of the strongest Mega evolutions out there to the point they had to ban it in competitive play for a while. If that doesn't show the indomitable will of Mama Khan and her baby Khan, I don't know what will.
Star you and star me, Misty's signature Pokemon, shooting stars in the night sky. I've always really liked its design and concept. I only wish right now. I only wish they would have given it an alternate form by now. Maybe a third evolution? I think players are more detached from these Pokemon in particular because they don't have a face. So, unlike most Pokemon, you can't impose human emotions over them. They're so otherworldly and alien that it's hard for people to connect with them, which is the reason I've always liked them. Electabuzz, Elekid, and also Electivire. My first ever shiny, Sparkles the Electabuzz! Well, technically, Sparkles the Elekid thanks to the Johto games. I renamed her Buttercup later on because I was a big Powerpuff Girls fan. I've always been more of an Electabuzz person than a Magmar person, so getting a shiny one when I played the Johto games was the coolest thing for me. Between Buttercup and Klexar, there were very few Pokemon that could stand up to them. When it comes to powerhouse electric types, this is usually one of the ones I think about. It also helps that it has the elemental punches, which means if it outspeeds the ground type, it can launch into an ice punch and devastate it before it could do anything about it. I've used this weird bipedal electric tiger on more playthroughs than I can count. Now, as for Electivire, it's fine? I don't love it as much as I love Electabuzz, but it's still a cool upgrade for one of the original Pokemon. Magikarp and Gyarados. Do you want to buy a Magikarp? It only knows Splash right now, but once you get it up to level 20, you'll be rewarded for your efforts with a beautiful Gyarados. I've named it Ariel from The Little Mermaids more times than I can count. Can you imagine this Pokemon emerging from the deep blue sea, singing part of your world on top of a rock as water splashes around her? <sighs> truly, truly outrageous. Lapras. I swear to you, I was cursed to never pull this Pokemon from a card pack. It's so beautiful, so adorable. This has been a staple Pokemon for me more times than I can count, despite its horrible weakness to rock. Ash was an absolute fool giving this plesiosaur up. I know she was going back to her family and the scene was beautiful and made me tear up as a kid, but rarely using Lapras again? One of the dumbest moves Ash has ever made. I've used Lapras so many times in games and in tournaments, it's a great Pokemon. Ice types might be on the weaker side, but at least its HP backs up the multitude of weaknesses it has. I also have a little plushie of it that sits on my desk while I'm recording. Her name is Nadine. A small note, because of all the evolutions that exist, I'm only covering the ones from Kanto for the sake of my sanity. I'll talk about the other ones later. Eevee, everybody's favorite fox Pokemon. While Eevee and its evolutions are on the overrated side, you'd still be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't have a favorite evolution. Even in its base form, Nintendo has given this little fox a lot of love in terms of special attacks, Z moves, and Gigantamax. As for me, I have a soft spot for the base form of Eevee because it was one of my late abuela's favorite Pokemon to see when she was helping me sort out my many Pokemon cards. Flareon. By pure appearance, I like Flareon the best of the original trio. It looks fluffy and I want to cuddle it, even though it's ill-advised, according to its Pokedex entry, that is. Tragically, Flareon was the worst evolution in terms of move pool for a long time, only being improved in recent games. I still love it though, but they did this little fox dirty. Jolteon. Such a cool Pokemon, truly embodying its element to its fullest. It's an angry spiky boy, but I love him anyway. A bolt of lightning in its base form, it's one of the better electric types in terms of design. It's the fastest of the evolutions and can crank out devastating attacks. It even has a little versatility in its move pool with Pin Missile, which, despite its small damage, was a solid attack to deal against Sabrina's team back in the original games thanks to Psychic's weakness to bug. A solid choice for anyone's team. Vaporeon. Vaporeon has the most versatility of all the evolutions, a high special attack with great HP that allows it to tank through various attacks and deal damage. It's a Swiss army knife of evolutions with the stats to back it up. Also, it looks like a watery mermaid, which in this case is neat. It was the only mermaid Pokemon until Sun and Moon rolled around with Primarina stealing Vaporeon's thunder. Cubone and Marowak. 
With all the theories going around about this Pokemon and its evolution back in the 90s, it's really no surprise that it's as popular as it is. Everybody talks about the orphaned Cubone in Lavender Town and how he put their mother at peace. Marowak is an overall strong Pokemon if you give it room to grow, and its Alolan form is one of the cooler variant Pokemon we've seen in recent years in terms of design and lore alone. It's been featured in fan games, main series games, and the anime alike at this point. And if anyone is about to talk about how underrated it is, it has an Alolan form and it's a starter Pokemon in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. It is a viable Pokemon personality you can be. Your argument is invalid. Now, what do I think about Cubone? Similarly to Sandshrew, I've always had a strong love for it, to the point where in my collection of the original 151 Pokemon, in card form, I have multiple variants of it, because of how the artwork has treated everyone's favorite Sadmon well over the years. While I haven't used it on many teams, as I have other ground types on this list, remember when I mentioned Pokemon Mystery Dungeon earlier? Yeah, guess who tested as a Cubone? Omnimite and Omastar. You cannot look at these Pokemon and not want to just cuddle them a little. I mean, look at them. Yes, I know Omastar has a big scary beak, but maybe it gives good pecs. <laughs> See what I did there? Anywho, I've gotten more attached to these two Pokemon more recently than I did back when I was playing yellow on my Game Boy Color. <laughs> Never started using Omastar until I got to gold and silver. That was around the time I managed to get a couple of cards for it. It was also around the time I started researching deep sea critters from 400 million years ago for fun. And did you know that they're based off of Amnemites? And that is neat. I thought it was cute in an ugly kind of way. You know, like a blobfish. Later on, as a full-grown adult with a brain full of animal facts that I can't delete no matter how much I try, I tend to name Omastar Adorabilis, after the scientific name for the flapjack octopus because it fits. Additionally, as a full-grown adult talking about a children's monster-catching game that she's been obsessing about since the 90s, allow me to remind you that in multiple sprites, Omastar looks like it's dancing. So let's have a jam session. Kabuto. Okay, so I'm specifically putting Kabuto here, because while its evolution is great and everything, this little buggy is cute and I love it. I have a pin that I have nicknamed Kabuto because it is a trilobite on which it is based. Since they're a trilobite, you could call them a trilobuddy. I've used them in little cup tournaments and they're a tiny menace thanks to its typing. I've also had a Burger King squirt gun toy of Kabuto for the longest time until its stomach caved in after I squeezed it too hard. That thing was my version of a fidget spinner till at least I was in my early 20s. Nothing else. I just love Kabuto's design. No notes. Aerodactyl. Aerodactyl is one of the best introductions to Pokemon I think you could probably throw at someone who doesn't know what it is. Stay with me here. Most kids know what a dinosaur is, and they think Aerodactyl is in fact one. Most kids know what a rock is. Most kids know rocks don't fly. So when you tell a kid that this is a f rock flying type, and then you explain to them how it works, you can really see the gears turning. It's a fossil Pokemon, a flying prehistoric creature. They'll say, oh, a pterodactyl. I love that dinosaur. You explain to them that pterodactyls are not dinosaurs, they are in fact pterosaurs. They ask you, what's the difference? You proceed to go on a journey through modern paleontology and explain to them they are not dinosaurs. Wait, is that just me? Okay, well, you get the picture. Zapdos, Moltres, and Articuno. All of the legendary birds are so cool. They completely embody their individual elements and show off a sense of majesty or intimidation whenever they show up. I love all of their designs and I have used all of them at least once in a Pokemon game. However, Zapdos is my all-time favorite, and let me tell you why. Not only is it the first ever holographic card I purchased, but it was also my first Pokemon piece of clothing with the hats they used to sell with Pokemon on them, and it has a cool cry from Pokemon the Movie 2000. Not only that, but Zapdos fits 
more holes on teams that I've had while playing Pokemon than the other two birds do. Mostly because it's not only an electric type, but a flying type, which lets me add in a more obscure choice since I have those two niches covered by a single Pokemon. While rock types are a pain for the most part, Zapdos is overall a great Pokemon to have. Also, it's a big spiky murder bird. How cool is that? Mewtwo, the final boss of the Kanto games. The most overpowered legendary Pokemon in the original games, and the most weird and depressing Pokemon to make a plushie of. The threat of Mewtwo in Pokemon, the first movie, cannot be denied. They built up his existence in the anime with Giovanni unleashing him on Gary's Pokemon and showing hints of his existence throughout the entire series. When we finally see him, we know his backstory. We've learned the tragedy of his existence. We know why he's doing what he's doing. The weird cat fetus thing is probably one of the most well-developed Pokemon in the anime as a whole. Maybe next to Pikachu. There's a reason it gets the love it does, outside of nostalgia for the original series, and that's because they make Mewtwo seem like a real person. Don't get me wrong here, I do think he's a bit overexposed at this point, and his getting two separate X and Y mega evolutions was absolutely silly, just like it was for Charizard. But I can't deny the legacy this Pokemon has. Heck, I even used Mewtwo as my main back when I played Super Smash Bros. Melee, despite how bad it was. Because I thought his powers were just pretty killer. Mewtwo is a Pokemon that lives up to the legend that was created for it. And considering the other designs they've come up with over the years for our great legendary pantheon of Pokemon, I feel like Mr. Bipedal Cat Fetus will always have a place in my heart. Mew. Speaking of cat fetus, Mew is the cutest little thing, and the fact that every Pokemon's DNA can be canonically traced back to it is wild to say the least. Mew being able to learn just about any move because of the fact it is the genetic blueprint for all Pokemon is such a great touch that Game Freak did that makes me really appreciate Mew. It has appeared in multiple films and is one of the cutest parts of every single one. I've always enjoyed seeing it appear because of how playful it is and like a newborn kitten or child, being extremely powerful yet also naive to how the world works. And while we never were able to find it under the truck like we all thought we could back in Red and Blue, it is fascinating to me that not only the fact does this Pokemon have in-game lore, but legendary internet lore, with goodness knows how many clueless kids trying to desperately find the elusive Mew. During the premiere of Pokemon the Movie 2000, I was part of the lucky group of kids who got an ancient Mew card and reveled in the fact that I was holding Pokemon history. Who knew? Such a cute, simple Pokemon would be one of the most sought-after things in the Pokemon world, both in and out of game. With that final entry on this monolith of a list, I must remind you, if you want to see more of me talking about Pokemon, please mention it in the comments because I don't have any idea of what sort of content anyone wants me to make. I'm Red Angel, and I'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.